Right, welcome everyone to the fifth session of the uh, 2021 Developer Conference. Um, and this morning we are delighted to have uh, Tim Whitehand from Petrodynamics, and he's going to be describing a rather remarkable aircraft called the Transwing and the efforts to uh, uh, fly this with Pilot. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Andrew. Um, good morning, good afternoon, I guess good evening to you, Pete. Um, anyone else in the UK? Um, so yeah, Tridge gave me the opportunity to present Transwing. Um, for th those of you who don't know it, um, really we've got a unique or novel transverse folding wing design. Uh, we're really focused on small UAS at the moment. Um, it's sort of scalable to a variety of different applications. Um, and um, recently, among other autopilot systems, we've been using Argypilot to um, see what we can accomplish. Um, I'm relatively new to Argypilot. Um, I'd say I've been using it for a good part of one, maybe two quarters, um, but um, it's been fantastic. I mean, coming up the curve is really fast and really easy. You guys have done a really fantastic job with uh, the documentation and the support community. So um, I have assumed that a number of you have probably not been exposed to this. So I thought first thing I'd do is jump into a video. It really describes, um, you know, what, what we have, what we're doing. Um, so I'm gonna try and play this one through the um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, Tridge, let me know if it comes through, okay. Yep, coming through fine. So this is a flight test from, oh, I'd say October last year. So you can see take off to a hover straight into transition. So onto the wing in 10 seconds, and then you're off flying like a regular plane. Um, you'll see a mission planner overlay here. Um, we actually flew this um, using RG Pilot as a fixed wing controller only. This was before we were sort of comfortable with it, um, you know, doing any forms of transition. So we're actually flying this in VTOL and transition with a KK2 controller, which switched over to RG Pilot when it was on the wing. So as you can see, um, that's what it does. It takes off like a quadcopter, it's on the wing and it's uh, in an efficient mode of flight as quickly as possible, which is you know, quite unique in the sense that um, you know, we're, we're going after the hybrid quads that'll take off and sort of lope up to a sort of a vertical point 30 feet above you, then sort of move into a forward transition. Um, we're all electric at the moment. So we're, it's all about energy conservation and efficiency. Um, so we wanna get on the wing in that efficient state as quickly as possible. Um, and, um, you know, we have a propulsion system that um, acts for both VTOL and uh, fixed wing flight. So we're not carrying any sacrificial like booms, any additional propulsors that are really just carried along for 98% of the flight. So I'll pause that and we'll go to the next slide if I can. So here's a bit more of a close up of the, uh, the transition fold. So this is one of our uh, 12 foot prototypes. We have um, aircraft from four feet to 12 feet at the moment. And we're working on some larger aircraft up to about 300 pounds. Um, but our focus right now is on this uh, 12 foot design um, in the fixed wing state, pretty conventional. Um, so essentially a high wing can be a low wing, V tail can be a T tail or a cruciform tail. Um, really, that's um, not really a factor in terms of the design itself. It's all about the wing fold. Now, uh, what makes our uh, guest configuration interesting? Um, so I've already mentioned the same propulsion system um, for VTOL as for fixed wing. Uh, we get on the wing really, really fast. Um, that's really key. Um, so because we're not carrying that sacrificial uh, lift system, we can... Um, we can cheap higher lift the drag. And when it comes down to electric VTOL aviation, the heavy hitters are, you know, lift the drag, disc loading, payload fraction, um, and um, battery energy density is a limiting factor for everyone. No one is going to have some magic battery that's going to be, you know, 20, 30% better than everyone else. So you've only got a few buttons to play with and lift the drag is a big one. So we've got a really controllable transition. Um, we'll jump into that in a little bit. Um, but basically, 
um, we're able to transition this on a very, very simple like KK2 PI controller. Um, what we're doing with RG Pilot and some other uh, flight controllers is we're um, looking to tune that transition in more detail. So to really sort of um, get the most out of this configuration, um, you really need to be able to tune a, a various number of set points through the transition um, in the, you know, the PID loops. And, um, and you know, we're making really good progress on RG Pilot and I'll um, get into some more detail um, on that in a few slides. But um, some other factors, uh, reduced takeoff and landing area. Um, a lot of people are really interested in that. Uh, wings fold in, um, you know, instead of having a 12 to 16 foot wingspan, you've got a, you know, five, six foot span, effective span in uh, VTOL. So you can pull out of a box, launch it without having to put wings on. Um, we have some interesting, I'd say, um, wind resistance. Um, so your typical hybrid quad with a large wing span will be pretty susceptible to a cross. It'll want to lift up a wing. Um, we're in a little bit different where we have sort of a, a transverse, um, like flat plate that'll want to push us sideways. Um, but we have some unique advantages in terms of our inertia and the ability to take off and maneuver in cross conditions. Um, got a scalable platform. Um, as you go bigger, obviously the wing fold, um, there's definitely some challenges there. Um, we don't see them as problems, um, more a case of just getting the work done. And uh, the angle of attack of the wings, so between fixed wing and about 50%, the uh, effective angle of attack stays within 20 degrees. So you'll find actually through most of the transition, the wing is actually very effective. And you can see that um, in test data, um, you look at your power consumption through the transition. Once you get through uh, effective translational lift, um, the power comes off really, really fast. So that's uh, really quite interesting. So why RG Pilot? So we started with KK2. It's simple. It's lightweight. It's cheap. You know, you can buy a board for $20, $30. You can stick open aero on it. that allows you sort of linear scaling between two states. It was a great place to get started. Um, but, um, you know, no logging of telemetry, pilot inputs. You can't really do much between those two states. Um, so it was great to prove out the platform and, you know, look, this does work. Um, here are some areas you need to work on. Now we want to dive into that sort of that transition um, portion and really tune it in properly. So RG Pilot, um, you know, preaching to the choir here, a lot of large selection of boards and peripheral devices, um, you know, much higher reliability than some of the cheap, smaller um, uh, boards, cost effective, you know, the system we're using is all up about 250, 300 bucks. Um, open source, the community that, you know, gets excited about it, uh, the documentation. Um, when we actually do get to a point where we're actually performing proper missions and, you know, operations, the training burden is really low for RG Pilot. There's a you know, huge user base out there. There's going to be some unique things to our configuration. However, um, you know, a lot of the work's already done there. Um, so another thing that's really interesting that's, um, I'd say, you know, sounds like it's reasonably new is the custom scripting um, via Lua, which really allows us to make some really interesting changes without having to recompile code. Um, and then also the um, software in the loop with real flight. So a little bit more about controls. So um, what I've got here is um, a six foot trans wing um, showing center of gravity and center of pressure, uh, the side component level on the left and combined on the right. Um, one of the real sort of unique challenges here is that the wings fold back, you'll find there's a crossover in center of gravity to center of pressure. So, you know, traditional fixed wing aerodynamics, you want to keep a positive static margin. Um, we keep um, quite a lot of mass in the wings for inertial relief. Um, you can imagine some batteries in the outboard nacelles, possibly some batteries in the inboards. As that wing swings back, we have a huge CG swing. Um, so from an aerodynamic and um, also from a uh, motor management standpoint, you know, there's a few tricks in there, particularly as the, the center of gravity crosses over the center of pressure. Um, what else? We've talked about roughly the weight and balance, thrust vector sweep, which I'll jump into in the next couple of slides. And we've got some interesting aero going on. Um, you know, we've got a, quite a lot of spanwise flow, um, particularly some um, interactions between the nacelles and the wing. 
angle attack is really not as it seems. It's sort of hard to um, show you in a 2D picture, but you know, the first sort of 50% of the transition, the effective angle of attack is actually fairly low. You know, you don't, you have a semi-stalled wing, but it's actually um, providing lift. It's actually the control surfaces are active. Um, in the later stages of the transition, the control surfaces, it, it's, it's somewhat, um, uh, difficult to characterize how they're actually working in the later stages because the wing's fully stalled. Um, but another a, a brief way to describe it is they act as sort of like a damper and they're actually really important to some of the uh, transition stages. Uh, we've got some blown effects as well. You know, we've got big props right in front of the leading edge. Um, we've got an articulating hinge at a um, pretty critical part of the wing. So if you've ever done any... Um, wing structural analysis you'll know your bending moments are going to grow as you come towards the root of the wing so we're converging a lot of our wing loads to a single point and um, because of that um, we're going to have to deal with some unique stiffness challenges um, we're just not going to have the same stiffness as a full box wing um, and then that leads to you know control challenges um, phase lag and also simulator versus actual so a little bit about the transition mechanics. Um, so I'm going to step through the transition um, from VTOL to fixed wing. So in the VTOL position, it's essentially a quadcopter. What I'm showing you there is basic thrust vectors and the torque reaction from the motors, uh, no control surfaces, no lift, no drag, no MG. Um, so nothing um, you know, unusual here. It's a quadcopter, fly around at you know, minus eight to plus eight. Um, Pitch and roll really strong. IXX is really low. IOI is, is fairly high. Longitudinal CGs centered between the propulsors, right about here. Can you see my cursor okay, uh, Andrew? Uh, yes, no problem. Very good. Okay, 25%. This is where it gets interesting. Um, you're still flying around like a quad. Um, it's sort of a, uh, you know, a bit of a messy quad or a dirty quad in the sense that um, you're still, you know, flying it with the same, you know, reference system, you know, um, you're still in Q stabilized, it's still stable, but you're going to get starting to get a bit soggy in some of the axes. Um, this is really interesting. And I can show you in a chart later on, this is where you have a yaw crossover. So basically imagine your diagonal motors, the torque reaction in a quad motor um, situation, giving you your yaw control as the wings come out. Um, there's actually like a, 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 a essentially a flipping where you've got the diagonal motors which will be fighting the left versus right thrust to control your. Um, so in this configuration, you can fly around just fine up to about 10 meters a second. Uh, any faster than that really doesn't start to like it. And you want to open up the wings a little bit further. Uh, the control surfaces are coming active. 50%. Um, again, you can fly around just fine. It's, um, it's more like a flying it like a plane. You've got some forward speed. Your angle of attack is coming up. Your wings are still effective. Um, we've got some cross coupling in the propulsors, um, which makes control a little more interesting. Um, so you're starting to get a bit weaker in pitch, but your control surface, your VTAL is becoming more active, which is helping out there as well. Um, one thing we notice here is um, it really helps to have very active ailerons at this point here, even more active than on the wing with lots of D. Um, and that's why we want to sort of dive into the transition and actually go and tune each points um, in, you know, with P, I and D all separate to actually get the most out of the configuration. 75%. So generally what the way we fly at the moment is we will um, transition to about 50%. Um, verify everything's working fine and then slowly transition to 100. We won't dwell at around 50 to 75 percent but technically you know you can 75 to 100 is fine. It'll just fly around like a like a very sort of so much uh, slow dirty draggy uh, fixed wing aircraft. Um, at these later stages the wing the inboard portion of the wing still not active um, there's a lot of drag being created there and also have a little bit of a um, upward angle on the thrust so imagine it like high alpha flight you can fly quite slowly but it's not very efficient another little video here this is an outbound transition from a hover um, ignore the linear actuator there it was starting to come apart you can see we're at about 50 percent still 
wings level, happy to fly around in some turns. Um, you'll get some roll oscillations if the controller isn't tuned right, some of the cross coupling. And I believe in this video, it'll go through a full transition as well. Ah, up to 90% on this guy here. So at this point, it's just flying around like a normal uh, fixed wing airplane. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. Okay, next slide. If I can operate my computer. Is that coming through okay? Yep, coming through. Yeah, that's good, right. looks good. So uh, fixed wing, a um, little low on the volume there, Tridge. Um, I'm not sure if that's me. I can only just hear you, but that's okay. We'll continue. Uh, it's probably at my end. Yeah, right. Okay, so fixed night. wing, transition mechanics, um, no big mystery here. Cruise configuration, we're a conventional multi-propulsive V-tail. Tail is a bit on the stubby side at the moment. Um, we're playing around with different tail sizes. Um, we're still sort of optimizing for the right sort of tail length, tail size. Um, we've got a vertical stabilizer at the moment that's not moving for directional stability during flight tests. That'll probably disappear. Um, and um, differential thrust is nice to correct for any adverse yaw. We've got the really long, skinny, high aspect ratio wing and the kind of not so, um, a tail that, um, is somewhat um, you know, disproportional to what you typically see on like a high performance glider. So IXX is really high, IYY is sort of medium to low. Couple more videos. So this is one of our flight test prototypes with the folding props. Um, the previous video was a um, earlier prototype with um, much higher, uh, lower aspect ratio wings. So this is the, the higher aspect ratio design. So this is actually transitioning on KK2, um, manual flight. Um, so really it's just providing basic stability augmentation. Um, as you can see, it's um, some pretty tight turns there. Um, that's outbound and inbound. Okay, now into uh, Archer Pilot and what we've been getting up to. So um, already talked a little about KK2. Some of our early attempts were to create custom code to really replicate KK2 gain scaling, which is basically two essentially set points. Um, you can use that for a variety of things, even tail sitters. Um, that worked just fine. Um, but when we're sort of replicating it, um, it, 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 it was okay. Um, and it was a really great way to uh, learn RG Pilot its strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I'd say in the last quarter, we've sort of, sort of shifted gears, changed strategies. And what we're looking at now is taking quad plane and determining what elements are missing to actually allow this configuration to fly with as minimal sort of uh, code manipulation as possible. And what we've done with that is with Lua scripting. Um, so, you know, basic block diagram there, really straightforward. We went from the CAD, we create a MATLAB physics model, which informs a set of matrices that we put into a custom branch of, um, of master um, and run it in the SIDL. So at this point where we're still in the sort of the simulation bench test phase, um, and um, I'd say in the coming weeks, we'll probably start stretching out and start doing some testing um, on the actual aircraft itself. So a little bit about the physics model um, that um, Peter Hall um, assisted us in building. Um, so I'll uh, do a little introduction and Peter can talk through some of the uh, scaling factors. So we talked about, we talk about two references here um, and we're sort of still developing both. Number one being your standard reference frame. Number two is a little bit trickier in the sense that if you imagine the IMU is sitting inside of the wing 
So if the IMU is transitioning and folding and rotating in 3D space, um, that's what you're seeing on the right there. So really um, basic model that takes a CAD, um, replicates the, um, the geometry, the thrust vectors, and then rotates them through a sweep. So um, are you there, Pete? Oh, I'm not yep, sure if Pete has here. present uh, capability. Oh, there he is. I'm here, yeah. Yeah, so I'll just introduce this, Pete, and you can sort of jump in and um, um, mention anything that, interesting that I might have missed. So what you've got here is in the bottom left, you've got our matrix factors, or oh, sorry, top right first. So matrix factors, bottom left is the same factors normalized by inertia, really important. And then the bottom right is the final gain scaling factors that we apply uh, essentially like a number from zero to one that's applied to AP motors. Um, and you can see three um, points of the charts that are uh, circled. These are interesting. So I was talking earlier about the your crossover in the early portion of the transition. You can see that guy there. Um, in pitch, um, as the wings fold out, you've got VTOL on the left, to fix wing on the right, you can um, if you can visualize by looking at these vectors, pitch control via motors only is going to come less and less effective as that uh, moment arm decreases dramatically. And then towards the end, you almost get to a you know a singularity or like a divide by zero error. Um, roll. Um, let me think about roll here. Um, Pete, do you want to explain the? Um, the yeah, so, roll so that, chart there in the right. So that roll weirdness is as roll. So so as we're in the sort of quad mode, roll is is dominated by thrust, and then as the wings come straight, suddenly roll is now controlled by only motor torque. So you can imagine all the thrust vectors are lined up. So the you you change the thrust, you don't change roll, but the torque changes roll. So that inversion is when they go from being thrust dominated to torque dominated. So what we've done on the next slide is we've taken the bottom right and blown it up. So um, we've basically gone and manipulated the code a little bit, or at least the physics model to cap out those, essentially those funny, um, you know, um, I guess off to infinity errors. And um, really this is, you know, in the guts of it, this is what you're looking at. So you can see roll pitch in your, on the roll side, you're in the quad mode, very effective in roll. Um, as you go to fix wing, obviously that goes down to near zero, but that's fine because midway through the transition, all your control surfaces are coming alive. Um, and pitch and yaw should be um, you know, fairly straightforward. So I'll leave this one to you, Pete. This is really talking about what we've actually done with um, Lua and what we've had to change inside of Master to allow us to run these scripts. Yeah, so it's it's actually not that dissimilar from my uh, six off stuff uh, we talked about uh, this morning. So so firstly, we just add a new motor backend. Uh, so you can see uh, there's a, a commit here adding a motor backend. Uh, there's a few scripting bindings, and then we we add each motor, we sort of define each motor with this uh, add motors table, uh, motor interp table. So it's very like the stuff we looked for six stuff uh, uh, yesterday. So we've got roll, pitch, and your uh, motor one, two, three, and four. So it's it's almost exactly the same. Uh, unlike the six stuff stuff, obviously we haven't got, you know, uh, forwards, uh, backwards, left and right. So we've got our standard roll, pitch, your just as you would have for a normal copter. And then we associate each of those table with a point. So this table at the top is uh, like point zero, and it's got all of these factors for motor one through four, roll pitch, your. And then we add another table. So this is point one in this case, and we've got another set of factors. So we've got, uh, in this instance, there's 11 of these tables. There's one for zero, point one, point two, all the way to one. So that zero to one value that is associated with each table is an interpolation point between forward flight and the hover configuration. So we just do a big lookup table for, for AP motors and load in these, these numbers. And uh, just like the six stuff stuff, loading it in with a script in the beginning is much, much easier than having hundreds and hundreds of new parameters. 
Uh, so uh, sort of scripting is a, is a sort of easy way to make this really easy to configure. We don't have to add hundreds of parameters uh, and it, it is all quite friendly. And in fact, the, the MATLAB plots we were looking at early, earlier, they, in fact, the MATLAB plots just generate this, these tables for you. So you, it's, it's a copy and paste job uh, from that MATLAB physics model. Very good. So then on to simulation. So, um, sorry, can I thank actually, you. can I just jump in? It's Randy. Um, sure. I was wondering, um, maybe this is one for, for Peter Hall, but I or whoever really doesn't matter. Um, how do you know what, what, uh, like how are you tying these uh tables to um to the point in, in the transition? Like, I mean, I, I guess you know, there's a pilot input, are you using pilot input to? Pick the table, or how's that happening? We've got a couple of um, we've got a couple of methods um, at the moment. In the latest release, um, there is um, the ability to control the wing tilt manually um, using the Q man throttle command, I believe it is. But that's really just for testing in Q stabilize. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but we're really just pegging this to the Q wind tilt parameter. Yeah, that's, that's right. So we 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 just grab the output. The, the wing tilt servo output. We just get the normalized output for the wing tilt, and we just use that as our as our lookup table interpolation point. Uh, so oh, it's, right, it's okay. all very straightforward. Right, yeah, we cool. haven't got any tricky. We haven't tied it to airspeed or some other like uh, parameter that you do in more sort of an automated operation. We're still in the sort of exploration phase, and we do want to have you know control over some of these things. But you know, going forward, um, when we want to really automate this thing completely. We don't want to pilot on the sticks. You know, we want to plan a mission, select auto and go. Um, you know, there's there's some cool things we could do there. Um, once we know we've got, um, you know, airspeed acting reliably, um, it might be more complex than just using the Q-tilt parameter. We can, um, we can it, depending it on actually... the mission profile and the transition profile. It is actually linked in directly. If you if you did take off in auto, the because the wing tilt itself during the automatic transition um, does go as a as a rate until it reaches the, the specified angle, but it, it then holds based on the airspeed. So it is indirectly linked Q to the airspeed. Yep. Um, but uh, it's not. It's like there's a step function there, and it's using the same strategy we use for current quad plane code. So there is a linkage in there to airspeed, but not a smooth one. Um, one of the problems is you might end up backing off and oscillating, and particularly with some lag in the wing tilt. If you've got you've got the, the the rate of airspeed update, the rate that the wing is tilting, et cetera. If you tried to link it too directly, you could end up like oscillating the wing tilt, uh, which yeah. is why in the original tilt quad plane, we didn't actually directly link that to airspeed because otherwise you, you I actually did try that very early on. You end up with very, very nasty oscillations and you're far better off sort of driving it through slowly um and uh if you are on a forward transition the, the difference with this aircraft is that I, I think it'll be a far more common operation to hold partially uh tilted whereas our current quad planes we either are we're either doing a forward transition or we're doing a back transition or the pilots controlling the transition um you're not doing a mission where you're deliberately holding a partial transition and that's something new in our quad plane code that's going to require some some considerable thought in how we control that angle versus airspeed. Yeah, I've got that in the latest slide, Andrew, which is more like a, a Q tilt max overhaul, or not so much an overhaul, but you know, expanding on that. Um, yeah, you know, it's we're going to be different very in the sense to, that to see, particularly with sort of noise and gusts and things, and you don't want a gust to sort of change the tilt suddenly if it's just a short gust. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You add more complexity and, you know, your vault tree just expands. Um, yeah, one thing that uh, I guess it doesn't too much differ from your normal tilt plane, but, you know, from flight testing and, you know, I guess operational experience, this, this airplane wants to accelerate through transition quickly. So, yes, you know, we do want to get to a certain airspeed before sort of committing, but we want it to be very dynamic. We don't want it to you know, take off, sit at 50%, build up speed, move on to the wing. It's it's going to happen fast and we don't want to, uh, I guess, how would I say, like cap it to a Q-tilt max at the moment. And you'll sort of see that in this video here. Um, so what I've got here is we've got our real flight uh, model for our six-foot prototype. 
And um, I've got this um, video running on master. So this is just straight up master. Um, the new code is not part of this. Um, not quite ready for prime time, but um, we'll see if this comes through. So my screen capture was not quite um, as clever as I thought. So you only got a quarter of the screen, but it should be coming through fine. So take off straight onto the wing. A short little mission to fly out on the other side of the, uh, the desert here to have a look at a sign. This was just a Q hover, uh, may have been a Q loiter to fly by YA. So on fly by YA now, uh, bring back the power, reducing altitude. Um, it likes to transition, you know, closer to 22, 24 meters a second. Back transition, you can see some um, some pitch disturbances there. Um, you know, we can play around with the um, the Q pitch settings, but um, I think what will happen is once we load the new code, a lot of this stuff's going to go away. Um, we're able to tune the, the D terms a lot better. So then turn around, back onto the wing. See where it paused there? That was where I believe it hit the Q tilt max. Um, didn't have sufficient speed to continue. Um, we're sort of tricking it at the moment by setting our fly-by-wire minimum speed very low and our Q-tilt max very high. So I think the Q-tilt max on this is about 80. Our um, fly-by-wire min's about 22, which is kind of like right on stall. Don't really want that at this weight. Then back into a normal multicopter. We've kept this model um, as close to the real life aircraft as possible. Um, we're carrying a five pound payload at about 23% mass fraction. So with this wing area, we're carrying a really quite a high uh, wing loading. So, sorry about that. Um, it'll want to fly fast um, and, um, you know, fairly different to, you know, your normal RC airplane where um, you'll, um, sorry, I've just got a phone call in the background, I'm killing. An RC airplane where you'll sort of take off at you know moderate speeds, fly around the loop. Um, this plane really wants to accelerate and get out of view very, very quickly. So, you know, we're excited to get this thing flying nav and auto missions as quickly as possible. So flight testing. Um, I guess this is a work in progress. Um, we've got the airplane flying uh, as a quad, flying nav missions. Um, we've been massaging the uh, Q man throttle, uh, the Q stabilized settings. So basically you can fly this like a multi-copter with the wings at a uh, partially folded state. Um, and uh, I'd say, just watch this space where uh, we're pretty close. And um, when we do have this flying, um, hopefully we can post some more videos. So on to sort of the roadmap ahead. We've got a long shopping list um, and, um, you know, we're going to chop um, a few of these off at a time. Uh, maybe some of them will be wrapped up um, depending upon the time I've got, um, some of our supporters and the projects we can fund and the projects that people are interested in. Um, but number one is we're going to choose a, um, a reference frame approach in terms of the uh, physics model. Um, so that will have two very distinct, um, I'd say, forks in the road as to how we handle the custom scripting through to master. At the moment, the second approach on the two, um, Peter did some really clever stuff with Q-trim pitch, which is typically used for tail sitters. Um, as you're coming in, say, for instance, you're on the wing, you're doing an inbound transition, you're going to click in Q stabilize, the AHARs will immediately pitch 90 degrees down and trick the, you know, the INS into thinking that um, it's actually moving with the wing twist. It works. Um, there's some, you know, there's some things we've got to work on, with it, but um, it really, when we explain this to new people, the, the reference frame on the right there, number two, it's really sort of hard to get, hard to get your head around. Um, number one, the standard reference frame, you know, straightforward out the gate. Um, with one, you have these, you know, these issues, these singularities that we run into, but um, there are ways of dealing with that manually. So once we've made a decision on the reference flame, I think we'll, um, we'll move through the next stage pretty fast. 
So on to the next slide. Error scaling of, scaling of control surfaces. So right now, all of this is just focused on the motors. Um, at the moment, when we do our testing, our control surfaces are fully active. Same with KK2. It's absolutely fine. Um, but one thing we'd like to do is have the control surfaces, really, they don't need to move in a quad mode. Um, and then we want to probably linearly scale them up to about 50% transition where they're at actually a very high effectivity. And then as you get back onto the wing, then to settle down again. Um, nothing um, overly complex there, but just some work. Um, we previously talked about Q-Tilt Max. Um, got some work to do there. Now, um, at the moment, our scaling factors really, uh, really just applied um, a scalar to the output of AP motors, which I understand is sort of like a, a, a mix of essentially the inner loop is taking into account the individual P and ID, PID terms. We're applying a factor to that. That's turning into a PWM that's going out to the motors. Uh, one thing we'd really like to do is be able to sculpt those terms individually, um, particularly the derivative. Um, part of that is um, we want to make it a bit more user-friendly. So I noticed in the latest beta on Mission Planner, there was a enhanced, I think it was a nav tuning tab. Um, it'd be pretty cool to put together a tuning tab to customize those, um, those set points um, live via Mission Planner, as opposed to shutting down, reloading the script, starting again. Um, it'd be really nice to have some dynamic um, tuning of those. Climbing transition with Q options. Um, so at the moment, we're sort of, at least my uh, primitive operator's standpoint with uh, mission planner, the missions are sort of take off to five or 10 feet, stop, move into a forward transition. What we really want to do is, you know, take off to a low hover just out of in-ground effect and then transition in an outboard climb, uh, outward climb. Um, as you saw in that first video. That's where a lot of this magic is. We can get onto the wing really fast. Um, that video, uh, the first one I showed of Paris 12, you know, that went from hover to fixed wing in less than 10 seconds. And, you know, that's what we're targeting. Um, inbound uh, approach. I have a question. Sure. Uh, Tim, uh, this is uh, Tom Pittenger. Um, how do you handle the uh, integrator buildup on your kind of flight surface near, near pitch and roll? When you're kind of in a quad plane or quad copter mode, and then you kind of hold it in some other, you know, some position, and you fly around and go into other modes, what what, what is your integrator term doing? Do, do you do anything to restrain it? Yeah, we're going to cap it. Um, in terms of what how far we've got at the moment, I don't have a really good detailed answer or some data to show you right now. Um, but typically, um, we want to keep the eye term on the low side and then have a, an eye max to prevent that wind up. We haven't had a huge, a lot of wind up issues to date. Not that we're not going to encounter them or we, you know, I fully have, um, a, you know, a deep understanding of um, where we're likely to see problems in either the, uh, the motor control or the control surface. Um, are you, um, are you primarily focused is your question more on the motor control or the control surface or both? More on the control surface. Because yeah. uh, on plane, you have like the whole, just, you have just a, um, you know, like an auto tune was doing the roll and pitch uh, type type uh, tuning. I'm just wondering how, how, that, in, in, how, how, that, how that really messes with your eye as far as just dealing with your wind up. Like, yeah, uh, I for, mean, for, we're for, not for doing anything, anything you... special right now, um, but okay. um, I can absolutely get back to you on it. No, I mean, if I may, so so when when we're flying on the on the motors, so you so we're in a Q mode. The motors aren't all locked to the to the, to the same PWM. So in, in that case, we use the integrator term, the sort of copter integrator term. We run the integrator off the motors, and plane keeps getting zeroed the whole time. And so so long as you've got enough sort of control authority on your motors, you, and and obviously you've got a huge amount more than than you would have on your control surfaces. So, so long as we've got enough headroom on that motors item, we just keep zeroing the plane item. And, it, and it's basically a fundamentally, you can't have the plane item and the copter item running at once because you end up in a, some, you might end up in a situation where like copter is trying to tilt forward and plane is trying to tilt back and the two items fight each other. So you can only use one at a time. And when the motors are active, we use the copter item and you've got so much control authority that, uh, 
you probably won't have a huge item just because there's so much power there. It was yeah, I mean, you've got the control. You've got the control surface wagging at that low speed, right? Um, as you know, they're trying to work, but there's insufficient airspeed to get a response, but the motors are controlling that. So, um, I mean, Peter, you could probably explain this in more detail, but um, if we weren't zeroing out the control surface eyes, they would you know, effectively wind up, wouldn't they? Because yeah, they are- Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, because the motors are doing the work, the control surface are trying, but they don't know that the motors are doing the work. Yeah, exactly. And, and you'd have the thing that you get on uh, uh, like tail dragger takeoffs and things like that. You get you would get nasty wind up and suddenly it would all become uh, effective and it would, would do a big dive or something whilst it's trying to clear its item. Right. Exactly. That's why you'd freeze it or lock it or, or zero it or something. But what, I, what my question is, is really not not a, what do you do when you're in full airplane versus that? It's, it's the transition. Because when you're in, you know, when you're flying around at your 75% uh, transition, uh, so, you, so you're, you know, mostly in the fixed wing size, you're, but you're still having effects from your motor library for that. You're, you, have a, you have basically have a large error that you're going to build up, uh, you know, intentionally because you need it for various you know, pitch or whatever aspect. So how does that, how does the integrators, uh, like at what point do you, maybe on the plot, what, I, what, I, what I'm, maybe the disconnect I'm not seeing is on, on that MATLAB plots. Um, if you can go back yeah, to that I think, slide. I think um, you're going to see that more at the earlier stages, at the I later here. stages. Um, yeah. You know, your control surfaces are very active and your motors are very ineffective in pitch and also roll. Um, so, you know, at those later stages of transition, the motors are great for differential yaw. They're very ineffective for everything else. So you're relying on the control surfaces at that point. Yeah, uh, can you go back a slide? I, so I think on the gain scaling here, I think this is probably answers my question maybe where the role in the pitch is, has more authority from the motors, but then not much on yaw, I guess. Is that, is that what this, um, the, the bottom right one shows like so so this would be like a decision of where you'd switch your pids uh, for 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 the roll for the roll pitch yaw it'd come from motor library versus come from the surfaces like the plane library uh at the moment the surfaces are independent of this this is really just a scaling factor applied to the motors itself and the the surfaces are fully essentially active from the start and they're going to come effective as air speed builds up but there's no logic in there that tells it to flip from one to the other now correct me if i'm wrong peter no you're you're, you're right so so basically uh, we're uh, as far as quad plane is concerned we're a, we're a copter until we get to that 100 percent tilt only once we reach that 100 percent tilt then we're a plane. Um, there's, there's a little subtlety in there in that um, you, you said earlier, Peter, that we could end up with, um, you know, the, the fixed wing trying to tilt up and the copter trying to tilt down. That actually won't happen because we always use the one demanded rate on each axis. So we, always, we only run the one attitude controller, but we run different rate controllers. And we actually slave the copter rate controller to the plane Attitude, the desired rate coming out of the plant attitude controller when in a forward transition. In a back transition, we do the opposite. We take the desired rate from the copter controller and we feed that into the plane's rate controller so that we don't end up with competing rates because otherwise you end up with the two controllers fighting each other in a really nasty fashion. Um, so it's we are actually on a single attitude controller just a different rate controllers on each of the the two controllers does that make sense anyway it's a it, it, we changed that last year uh, a little bit and um and the way we slave in the rates between the two but they could be running with different time constants because the different filtering between the two uh the target filtering is different well there's yet to be a day i haven't learned something new about rg pilot The, the the hole keeps getting deeper. Oh yeah, it's a it's a fun hole. <laughs> okay, so back to where we were. Um, so we're talking about uh, climbing transition, uh, expand inbound approach nav planning. So we can do some interesting inbound approaches. We want to be on the wing as you know long as possible, descend quite a high speed, 
low altitude and then we want to extend our sort of transition past our normal five six seconds to do a sort of a a, a long flat uh like uh the way to describe it is like a long flare um like we want a minimum energy approach so if you can imagine coming in on low bats and you really don't have a lot of power to give you want to have to avoid putting in that you know high throttle until you're almost ready to put down like an auto rotation on a helicopter so um we're going to play around with what what is actually able to be done now with mission planner i expect there'll be some some cool things we can do um in there um Next uh, bullet point I added at the last minute. So one of the earlier talks, um, Tridge, was related to ESC control. Um, one of the things we do at the moment to control a linear actuator that controls our wing tilt, we have a you know, off the shelf um, DC brushed motor controller with some micro switches. Um, so basically um, your uh, motor encoder output is going to give you the state at which the um, the transition is at, and we can control that by PWM. But we want to get a bit more sophisticated. We want to actively monitor the um, motor temp, the motor current, because you can imagine as the linear actually goes back to fix wing mode, it's going up against a hard stop, essentially, or at least a very hard spring. We want that motor to be tuned very well to keep those wings in the locked in position, particularly after we have like a secondary interlock, but we don't want that motor to keep pulling, you know, a couple of amps in this case and you know, burn itself out. So having more precise control over that motor and encoder, um, that'd be really, really nice. And I'm not sure if there's any sort of segue into what was previously talked about ESC control. Um, lastly, what we got, um, a better way to turn off and stow motors and fixed wing flight. So, uh, we have folding props on this six foot model. Um, the idea is you take off on four, once you're in a efficient cruise flight, you drop two, fold them up, increase your lift to drag ratio, um, and have more efficient flight. So, um, I believe there's some like bit masking options to do it. Um, we haven't really dived into it in too much detail, but um, it'd be really nice to be able to issue a command through a plan and say, you know, once you're on the wing, drop those motors, turn them back on, we're ready to transition. Uh, also variable pitch prop. Um, this configuration excels um, with the ability to control, uh, you know, pitch of the props itself. So you could imagine at the moment, a lot of our tests are done with a fixed pitch uh, sort of climb prop. Um, as your lift to drag ratios get into the low teens, the ability to go to a much coarser pitching cruise gives you tremendous gains in uh, range and endurance. So we've got a few little R&D projects uh, working on variable pitch mechanisms for the small size of aircraft so from like 12 inch props to up to about 22 inch props. Um, and when we get to that point, we're gonna wanna be able to have some, um, some clever control of, um, of that. Um, via RG Pilot. I'm unaware if there are actually any uh, functions available at this point, um, but I wanted to uh, drop the note in there in case it sort of um, pricked up anyone's ears. Um, and then lastly, you know, operator enhancements, you know, specific to the trans wing. Um, we want, you know, the person to be planning a mission. We want the system to give the operator feedback on the, the health of the approach. Um, you know, is the aircraft in the box? You know, way to describe it. Is he too fast? Does he have enough power? Um, you know, is his sync rate within limits? And you know, give him some, you know, visual enunciator to let him know where he is. And that is about it for now. Um, before I jump to um, questions, I'd like to um, just thank Peter Hall. He's done a tremendous amount of work um, on the Archipelago code. Uh, Brandon, who's been helping out a great amount on the real flight model and obviously Tridge and Andrew Rabbit, which was, um, it was great. He did some really awesome uh, code manipulations in the early days and um, look forward to working with all you guys some more. Um, at this point, um, I guess I'll, um, uh, give anyone the opportunity to ask any questions. Happy to uh, discuss anything in more detail. Um, go for it. Absolutely fantastic. It's really uh, great to see this aircraft coming together. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the first uh, full transition on, on RG Pilot uh, flight video in, the, in a real vehicle. 
uh, that'll be that'll be great to see. So any I, other? I have a, yeah. yeah, I have a question about just the uh, how that the slider that slides back down the fuselage, how that impacts just the structural integrity of the of the body. Yeah, so if you're thinking about the fuselage side, um, you're talking about this linear actuator running down the tail. Is mm -hmm. do I understand that correctly? Yes. Um, yeah, so you can imagine a normal fuselage, that entire section is going to be a torsion cell. Um, so you're going to have, you know, bending and torsion through that, depending upon the tail loads. We've basically gone and sliced that in half. So um, that's still a closed cell torsion, a box, um, but it's only got half of the, I could say, area moment of inertia. So what will have to happen is if we're going to continue down this route, and we've got a few different mechanisms for actually actuating the wings. This linear actuator is only one of them. Um, but basically, depending upon your tail loads, you've got to size that lower torsion cell to take all the, the structural loads. This top section here is really just a cover, an aero shell. So is there a considerable amount of strain when you're in like a halfway, you know, 50% or whatnot? Is it torquing, load, the, bearing the load somehow? Yeah, you're talking about the axial load down the actual uh, linear actuator rod here. Um, in this case here, um, this is a six foot model. We're talking, you know, probably in the order of like 15 to 20 pounds max. Um, we've actually designed this uh, linear actuator like um, like a, it's a custom all the way. We've got a, you know, a carbon tube and a, and a thrust screw and we've kept it really, really minimum gauge. And you saw in one of those videos earlier, um, I'll see if I could pull it up again. You saw the linear actuator sort of bucking around. Um, there's sort of a really, you know, there's a balance between strong enough and stiff enough and then starting to, you know, weigh too much. Um, let me have a look. Oh, this might be another good view. Um, actually, I'll go back to... This guy here. Um, so again, similar to the six foot model, you've got the slice down the side. Um, and on the 12 foot model, you're gonna have much larger loads. Um, but in terms of, can the structure handle it? Um, the linear actuator is actually the least of our concerns. Um, it's more the, well, I'd say the, the least challenging problem. Um, what's actually more interesting is as we scale this airplane up, um, the, the wing hinge itself, um, we're going to be focusing all of our loads on that. That's really what becomes the critical link. And as you go bigger, you can imagine having to put a secondary interlock in the back uh, for fixed wing flight. And um, as your you know, bending loads and your shear force of scale, um, your wing is going to be taller in airfoil and the, um, the wing hinge is going to scale with it. Um, Stress isn't really uh, a concern. It's more of a stiffness problem more than anything else. Okay, right, thanks. Um, I have one more question about uh, propellers or, or the motors during fixed wing flight. Do you keep all four motors going? Uh, at the moment we do. Um, the idea is to drop two. Um, you don't need all four um, for right. fixed wing flight. So then you have um, like the inners or the outers or whatever uh, um, be folding prop? Yeah, uh, so you'd have two that would be variable pitch, um, and they would be the, uh, the motors that you're going to run throughout the full duration of the mission, and then the others will just be a simple uh, fixed pitch folders. Why variable pitch? You can achieve much higher efficiencies in terms of um, prop error efficiency, better advance ratios. So basically in, in VTOL, you're going to be wanting a really, really fine pitch, you know, high RPM. Once you transition onto the wing and the airplane wants to surge forward, um, you're going to want to coarsen up that pitch. So with a variable pitch, you get the best of both worlds. Um, if you've got a slow, draggy airframe, um, like a Cessna 172, um, you won't really realize huge, um, I guess, performance increases. Whereas if you had a more... Um, like slick, higher lift to drag aircraft, like a, um, what's a good example? Like a long easy or a, um, I'm just trying to think. Um, total mental blank, but long story short, um, lift to drag, once you get up above sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, as you grow higher, the efficiency gains you can get from a variable pitch prop 
um, start to start to build up quickly. And well, we're talking so in the in interest of this airplane, assuming we've got to lift the drag of let's call it 12 to 14, we can probably increase our endurance and range by between 50 and 100%. Right, so just to be clear, the uh, the variable pitch is not necessarily for your forward flight. It's the to have a similar motor being uh, well to have one pitch configuration for VTOL and one configuration for forward. Or do you actually want variable during your forward flight? Oh no, you want the variable is all about the forward flight. Um, okay. What we could do, like say with fixed picks, you can optimize for one side or the other. Um, if, for instance, we had a high pitch props, fixed pitch, we're going to really, really struggle in VTOL. Um, we're going to get to a point, you'll keep coarsening up the pitch where you'll actually stall the props. So ideally you want a low pitch for VTOL to maximize your cargo carrying capability, maximize your control margin in VTOL, um, which is really important for taking off in you know, windy conditions. But once you actually transition onto the wing, you want to coarsen up that prop. And that really gives you all the advantages. It's in fixed wing because your, your, your VTOL portion is, you know, one, 2% of your whole mission. Right. The, this sort of aircraft might do better with a, if you lose a, one of the motors and you need to do an emergency fixed wing landing, uh, that, a lot of quad planes struggle with that. Um, and because they, they fly very fast. Um, how would this do if you had a partially... If you partially tilt the wing, you, you deliberately cut off the matching motor on the other side, so you're on two motors. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder how slow you could get it with a with a partially tilted wing for a low energy, you know, emergency landing. Yeah, it's a good, um, uh, I guess, an interesting thought process. Um, in its optimal configuration, um, this has a, a, a much higher wing loading, and we don't have mm. to actually have any low speed devices. Um, so mm. really we want to load up that wing um, to maximize our fixed wing, um, I would say fixed wing portion of our mission, depending upon what we're doing. And mm. really we're focused on, on getting fast. Um, a lot mm. of the hybrid quads, you know, they fly around at 60 knots. You know, we can get, you know, really flying with this guy, you know, well over hundred knots. And as we go to a higher aspect ratio wing, higher wing loading, um, you know, that makes, that really opens up that envelope. People want to get from point A to point B very quickly. Um, mm. So in this current configuration, this is more of a, um, you know, get somewhere, drop something off, take a photo that's 50 nautical miles away, as opposed to something that's going to take off and fly very low and very slow to take, you know, photos of a field. Um, so um, the configuration can be optimized from, you know, one side to the other. We could go and put a, you know, a large cord, low aspect ratio on this, on this aircraft and, you know, create a photography or surveying platform. Mm. Um, but this uh, configuration really does um, distinguish itself from the competition um, when you can access those, you know, those faster speeds. Um, in relation to the belly landing, um, that's going to be tricky. Um, I mean, uh, the Paris 6 that you're seeing, that generally likes to fly around, you know, higher than about 22 meters a second because uh, we don't have any low speed devices, you know, getting this thing slow enough to not, you know, come apart on the ground, belly land, it would be kind of tricky. But you mentioned opening up the wings a little bit. And I've actually seen that um, in what you can actually visualize that in one of these videos here. Um, let me find it. This guy here, um, where the wings aren't completely closed into the um, fixed wing position. And what we're finding here is this is, um, this actually didn't have a payload. It was fairly lightly loaded. We were getting this down to about 11 meters a second um, mm. flying around quite comfortably. So yes, you know, if you don't care too much about efficient flight, you can crack the wings open a little bit and bring that stall speed lower. Um, you also mentioned about uh, turning off two of the motors um, in, in the future for forward flight. Mm -hmm. Which two motors? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, so normally um, you'd want to be keeping your uh, inboard ones on, right? Because um, if the advent of a motor out, um, you know, technically there's, there's a possibility you could still fly on one if you had your, both your inboards active. Um, in our case here, um, when we're on the wing, we don't really want to be using the motors for active yaw. Um, you know, we're running all electric. We want to conserve the battery as much as possible. We'd rather the tail be doing all the work. So, I mean, they both have pros and cons, um, but um, yeah, I guess something to explore. Um, we don't have to comply to sort of the traditional rules of thumb in relation to, you know, motor out on two. You want to minimize that moment arm so you don't have to kick the rudder to stay flying. But at the same time, um, there might be some advantages. Um, I haven't really thought through it. Uh, uh, Tim, it's Paul. Can those wings be opened up asymmetrically? I mean, if you had a reduction of thrust on one side, um, you might At be the able... moment, no, yeah. but it's, a, it's an interesting um, point. Um, if we were able to control them individually, you could, you could do some pretty clever 3D stuff. But, but the real question is, how well does it fly upside down? <laughs> well, um, in the sim, it flies just fine. No, um, it's, um, we've definitely done a lot of interesting testing. Um, you know, getting to this point, you know, there's definitely been some tumbling. And, um, you know, I, I can't say we've done any fixed wing upside down flying, but um, the upset recovery is, um, you know, it's important. You're flying around at some mid-transition state. Something goes wrong. Your bailout is to go straight to VTOL. Um, everything's set up really nicely. Um, you know, you're talking two or three seconds, minimal loss of altitude. So um, well, uh, we'll, we'll eventually start getting into those maneuvers. If you start doing variable pitch, then you can just land upside down too. <laughs> yeah, if we take off that uh, vertical stabilizer and just stick with the VTOL. All right. I think we're about out of time and uh, done with, with questions. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, it's a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate it. So oh, thanks uh, for the opportunity. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. not not a lot of, not a lot of technical detail, but that's coming. You know, we'll do some do some cool stuff with RG Pilot and um, sort of watch this space. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. All right. So next up. Uh, we have uh, Bill Geyer and giving us a helicopter update. And uh, just hang on a second, Bill, while I switch over the recording.